we're seeing a society that not only has a lot more people of lower IQ, but a lot fewer people of higher IQ. In other words, a dumbing down, a chemical dumbing down of society. So everyone's sort of mediocre. That leaves them dependent on government because they can't excel. We have these people of lower IQ who are totally dependent. Then we have this mass of people who are going to believe anything they're told because they can't really think clearly. And very few people of very high IQ who have good cognitive function who can figure this all out. And that's what they want. So, you know, you can kind of piece it together as to why they are so insistent in spending so many hundreds of millions of dollars of propaganda money to dumb down society. Mr. Tooth Decay here. You know, making cavities used to be easy, but it's getting harder now. And mostly because of... Grass! Grass bites cavities, so I'm gonna bite grass! Now, grass got fluoride in it, and grass is always telling people to wax the beach, have checkups, and brush off it with grass! Fluoride. It is hailed by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. In fact, for over 60 years, the American Dental Association has stated that brushing with fluoride toothpaste will prevent tooth decay. But is this true? Is there more to the story than what we've been told? Triumph over tooth decay. Procter & Gamble announces Crest Toothpaste with Floristan, its exclusive fluoride compound, world's greatest weapon against decay. Look, Mom, no cavities. Yes, Crest Toothpaste really cuts down cavities because Crest has fluoride, the same fluoride dentists put right on teeth to prevent decay. With Crest, you put this fluoride on your teeth at home, too. Prevent cavities. Use Crest. Crest is accepted by the American Dental Association. Today, 95% of the toothpaste sold in the United States contains fluoride, and 72% of all water is fluoridated. Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Anything we can do to help prevent cavities on children, I think, is very important. Absolutely, fluoride is safe. It's effective. Fluoridation of community water is extremely safe and extremely effective in preventing tooth decay. Science is on the side of fluoride being safe and effective. There is no controversy. If it's such a simple issue, how is it that it's still going on after half a century? I remember it being debated yeah, when I was 13 years ago. And, and it's continuous debate. But just because we've been doing something 50 years doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Uh, public health officials knew then what they know now would we have fluoride? Would it be added to our drinking water? Well, today a coalition of scientists, dentists, and doctors are taking action to stop fluoridation until it is proven safe. When they're selling water fluoridation, they didn't just walk out and say it's good for you. They actually hired Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, to sell Americans on how good it was to have silica fluoride in the water. Edward Bernays was the one that created how to control the population through media and through advertising. Edward Bernays, also known as the father of spin, pioneered the idea of crowd psychology. In 1928, he wrote a book called Propaganda, in which he wrote, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing it? He called it the engineering of consent. Bernays introduced the corporate giants to crowd psychology methods and polished techniques to manipulate society. He convinced the population to buy on impulse things they didn't even need. In his writings, he concluded that individuals were controlled by four basic motivations, self-preservation, 
aggression, security, and sex. Bernays' belief was that by appealing to any of these four motives, it was possible to manipulate the majority of the population into doing almost anything. You could brainwash them into smoking cigarettes, starting war, electing politicians, you name it. And given the proven effectiveness of these techniques, it was no coincidence that the Aluminum Company of America asked Bernays to head the campaign for the fluoridation of the United States water supply. People like Bernays you know, were masters of social engineering. His entire thesis, if you will, is that you don't talk to the public in a rational, scientific way. Instead, you appeal to their emotions and you invoke their fears. He was key in getting women to start smoking. He positioned cigarettes as being sexy and individualistic and, you know, power to the woman. That was the, the framing of why women should start smoking. A consumerist culture was born, and the United States government took notice. U.S. agencies soon adopted Bernays' techniques of manipulation to manufacture the fear of ever-present danger in the minds of the people, to give those in power greater control of what Bernays called the mass mind. He went on to propose in his book, Propaganda, those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This statement holds just as true today as it did in the 20s when Bernays first wrote it. Throughout medical science, including dentistry, Poison-producing corporations have always been able to infiltrate major institutions and dominate their narrative. When Christopher Bryson was writing this book, The Fluoride Deception, he reached out to Edward Bernays. Bernays said it was child's play to convince the American public that fluoride was good for them. While the official narrative rang, the case for fluoride had been proven. Some people weren't so quick to jump on the fluoridation bandwagon because fluoride had been used for years as a rat poison to kill coyotes, to kill cockroaches. Some of those opposing fluoridation were in fact dentists. And because of their advocacy for safe water, they were censored by the American Dental Association. If they worked for the public health service, they got fired. If they were team players and kept their mouth shut, they got to keep their job. So out of fear, many people who knew better remained silent. Very few dentists are aware that the fluoride in public water supplies is not a pharmaceutical grade product. It is in fact an industrial waste. It's the uh, waste from the Florida phosphate industry. In the 1950s, the Florida phosphate industry was being sued by farmers and citizens living near those plants because of the fluoride that was killing their cattle, destroying their crops. You know, the Florida phosphate industry today is prevented from having to dispose of its industrial effluent in a toxic waste dump by the device of shipping that in tanker trucks around the country and dumping it in our water supply. From the beginning, opposition to fluoride has been uh, equated with uh, you know, believing the earth is flat or being against the United Nations. Opposition to fluoride is equated with quackery or, or, uh, or paranoia. Uh, and in fact, that's, uh, that's really a media smear. In 1950, the public health endorsed water fluoridation. Almost immediately, there was a national movement against fluoride, and that was led by Dr. George Walbot. We should all know George Walbot's name. Uh, he was the first physician to warn of the dangers of allergic, fatal allergic reaction to penicillin. Now, Walbot warned, was one of the first physicians to warn of the dangers of emphysema from smoking. He saw in his own uh, surgery, in his, his practice in Detroit, Michigan, uh, that people were coming in with these uh, ailments, unexplained ailments, whether it was back pain or gastric distress, uh, muscle fatigue, uh, headaches, uh, and he figured out that it was low-dose fluoride. That, as with a lot of drugs or chemicals, there's a small subset of people who are uniquely allergic to the chemical, 
and Wolbot realized that it was fluoride, and he performed uh, a whole series of double-blind experiments uh, where people were given some uh, fluoridated water without knowing it, and the symptoms recurred. And very quickly, Walbot's name, rather than being seen as this giant of public health, committed to safeguarding public health, uh, somebody who had warned us about penicillin or uh, tobacco, suddenly George Walbot becomes this marginal fringe figure who uh, is, uh, is criticized for his opposition to fluoride, and that's something that takes place again and again and again. Speaking out as a doctor or a dentist against fluoride is, is, is the third rail. Uh, it's, it's fatal to your career. Uh, we don't know George Walbot's name because he was smeared by the Public Health Service for his opposition to fluoride. In the uh, 1990s, the senior toxicologist for the EPA's Office of Water said that the cancer tests that had been done uh, on fluoride, where laboratory animals were given fluoride, uh, he said that those results had been gerrymandered, that in fact the equivocal verdict that fluoride was a carcinogen ought to have been much stronger. He said that uh, fluoride given to rats had produced bone cancer and liver cancer, and that those results had been doctored to make it look as though fluoride hadn't caused as much cancer. I've been in the toxicology business looking at studies of this nature for nearly 25 years, and I've never seen that. Never ever seen where every single endpoint that was a cancer endpoint had been downgraded. I'd seen one or two endpoints argued over, usually on a definition of what is a cancer in that particular tissue, but I've never seen every one of them downgraded. I found that very suspicious. Marcus was fired. Dr. William Marcus was fired, and a federal judge ruled that Marcus was fired because of his outspoken opposition to fluoride. The first two chapters of the book are, relate the story of Dr. Phyllis Mullenix at the Forsyth Dental Institute. She uh, had helped invent a new technology for studying the neurotoxicity of chemicals. Uh, it was called a computer pattern recognition system. And uh, in, in essence, uh, Dr. Mullenix's uh, technology uh, took uh, photographs or video of animals uh, which had been given a chemical in small doses and then use computers to analyze uh, the patterned behavior or the disruptions to patterned behavior when the animals had been given uh, that, that chemical. While Mullenix was brought into the Forsyth Dental Research Center to study the, some of the chemicals used in dentistry and she was asked to study fluoride and Phyllis Mullenix said uh, I'm not wasting my time with fluoride. Fluoride's given to children. It's good for children. It's been down, around for donkey's years. I'm wasting my time by studying fluoride. Uh, but she did as she was ordered. And, uh, and Phyllis Mullenix found that fluoride in very modest doses produces effects in laboratory animals resembling attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, um, one of the uh, individuals sitting and listening to the results, he says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. And basically, I said yes. She went from being an industry-funded, leading neurotoxicologist at a Harvard-affiliated research institute to being a voice in the wilderness. She has not received any grants, uh, nor any academic position as a research scientist since her opposition to fluoride was made public. The Center of Disease Control says that water fluoridation is one of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. How can citizens deal with something like that? A question authority. 
You know, for years and years and years and years, the public health establishment told us that lead in gasoline was safe. We know today that children's brains were damaged, were injured by uh, the addition of lead to gasoline. Uh, you know, the implications of this new documentary evidence, the implications of these buried medical studies, which are, which are now in the public domain as a result of my book, as a result of uh, you know, the medical work that's been done by people like Phyllis Mullenix, uh, the willingness to speak truth of uh, toxicologists like William Marcus, the implications uh, of that research, uh, of these new findings, is that something is terribly, terribly wrong and we have been led very far astray and it's time to change. But that change will only come as a result of uh, bravery, as a result of the willingness to invest time. You know, I, th I think it's time to, to speak up, to speak loudly, to get organized and to fight for change. Fluoride should never be added to our water supply, and there are plenty of compelling reasons why. Fluoride harms the environment. 99% of fluoride added to water never touches a tooth. It ends up on your lawn, or down your shower drain, or toilet. The result is waste that pollutes the environment. Fluoridation chemicals are toxic even at low doses. There are two compounds used for fluoridating water supplies today, namely sodium silica fluoride and hydrofluorosilicic acid. These are the waste products from the wet scrubbing systems of the fertilizer industry and are classified as hazardous wastes. Fluoride is also the only unregulated drug that is forced as a mass medication on the population with no control of dosing or frequency. In February 2014, researchers from Harvard University listed fluoride as one of the top developmental neurotoxicants. 37 studies showed a link between fairly modest fluoride exposure and lowered IQ in children. The poison warning on toothpaste labels is enough to sound the alarm. A mere one-fourth milligram of toothpaste ingested and you are advised to call the poison control. Beware, that could be the same amount found in one glass of fluoridated water. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention admits that 41% of adolescents now have dental fluorosis, which occurs from an excess of fluoride. This is a condition where tooth enamel becomes progressively discolored and mottled. Dental fluorosis is not just a cosmetic issue. It can affect other tissues, such as your bones and brain, if they've been overexposed to fluoride as well. These problems are a real health threat, prompting 98% of Europe to not fluoridate its water. Fluoride can harm you by damaging your bones and brain, lowering your IQ, causing thyroid dysfunction, and harming your teeth, contrary to what is promoted. You can find this substance in your tap water, in your toothpaste, and even in pesticide and fertilizer residue on the food you eat. There are different ways you can avoid fluoride and its potential side effects. Stop drinking fluoridated water. Teach your child not to swallow toothpaste. Avoid using fluoridated salt and stick to raw, organic, wholesome food instead of processed goods. Ask the pharmacist if your medication contains fluoride. It's high time to get fluoridation chemicals out of the public water supply. When over 99% is sent down the drain and into the environment, it hardly touches a tooth and provides the much heralded benefits. If experts and consumers are convinced of the benefits fluoride may provide, then it should be kept in the toothpaste, where it can be applied topically and out of the clean water supply. There is no logical reason to ingest this toxic poison in the form of drinking water.